I tried to incline my heart to hear the word of God, but the noise of life can drown him out. But if I just keep
Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Well, here we are, first day of the week at the Father of the Great Church of Christ. And as you know, because of the pandemic, we have been live streaming our services. So we have come this morning to bring you a word from the Lord, and we hope that it will comfort you and encourage you that you do the best you can with what you have where you are. And that's what we are doing at the Church of Christ. So we are going to have one of our brothers to come forward, Brother Roy Guy, and he's going to uh, talk you through the Lord's uh, Supper in just a few minutes. But before we do that, I just want to really open up our, our, what we're about to do with a word of prayer. So uh, how about you, um, where you are? Can you join me in this prayer? Let us pray. Oh Lord, oh Lord, how excellent is thy name in heaven and in earth. And surely, Father, it is a good day that we who are still alive in the midst of all of the crisis that we are experiencing at this time, we need to be thankful. Everything might not be going the way we want them to, but we need to be thankful. But there are so many that have passed on, there's so many that are doing, that are in the midst of uh, things that uh, might not be positive in their lives. But we who are here this morning, we need to be thankful. And we are praying for all those who are the front line. All of those who are trying their best in the medical field and transportation and food and all those uh, different agencies that are necessary for us to keep functioning as a city, as a state, as a community, as a family. We are thankful for all of those front lines. So God, now we are about to go into your word. We hope and pray that we can find some comfort that we can let our light continue to shine, that men may see who we belong to and who we are. Forgive us as always for our sins. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. We're going to ask Brother Roy, the guy, to come forward and he's going to talk us through at this time the Lord's side. of the reading and the prayer, you're going to need your Lord's Supper. So if you don't have a Lord's Supper cup, you're going to need your juice or your matzo, whatever you're using for your, your bread and your fruit of your body. Okay. Found in Matthew 26, 26 to 29. And that's how we read Jesus took bread. And blessed it and break it. Gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat. This is my body. And he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us pray. Oh, Father God, we thank you for these emblems that you have left. The blood, the fruit of the the bread, the Jesus' body, shed on Calvary's cross. We ask that you take this, these emblems as a memorial and not a we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So now this cup that we have, the bread is separated from the juice. There's a clear cellophane on top. 
We ask that you expose the bread. Okay. You take it. And then expose the feet. The food of the body. Now for the giving. Paul instructs us in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do we. Upon the first day of the week, let everyone who lay by him in the store, as God has prospered, that there be no gatherings when I come. Normally, we give in service, but due to the pandemic, we have to either send money to the post office, to the post office box. We have an app here at the church, you send your money through the app, and or on Saturday mornings between 9 and 2, when you pick up your Lord's Supper cup, you can leave your giving at that time. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for uh, the funds in which uh, the members have left. Uh, we know that everything is Jesus, and uh, we thank you for the portion in which we need for the church to take care of the church business. We ask you to also pray for those who are not able to give at this time, that they may be able to give at another. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I will sing one song and bring up the minister. Let the Spirit of the Lord rise among us. Let the Spirit of the Lord rise among us. Let the praise of our King rise among us. Let it rise. This is 
special joy that comes into my heart. Now, for this morning, I want you to meet me at 1 Kings. And I want you to look at verse, in chapter 19, and the verse is number one. And I want to read a few passages. First Kings, chapter 19, and the verse number one. And I'll read where we're going to really land this morning. First Kings, chapter 19, verse number one. And they Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah and said, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them, by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough now, Lord. Take my life. For I am no better than my father's. What a request from Elijah the prophet. I like to use that as a theme for this morning. From a mountaintop experience to the valley of depression. From a mountaintop experience to a valley of depression. We are in a crisis. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have never been in a crisis like this. I know I haven't experienced it. Everyone is affected in some way or another. And what, what might come to our mind is that does God have an answer for us? Is there a word of God sufficient for us today? I have always been of the belief that God's word is relevant to us today. It will be relevant tomorrow as it was relevant before, even in the patriarchal years or days. It's always relevant. If we can just have faith in it and apply it to our lives, we can gain wisdom. The Bible said that all scripture given by the inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for uh, correction in righteousness. That the man of God may be what? Truly or completely furnished to all good works. We have the word. Do we believe it? Because I believe it is sufficient. So what I want to do this morning is to show you that what we are going through now, that there is a word that can give us comfort, that there is a word that if we apply to our lives, it might help us not to live in a state of depression. Because I believe what we see here in our text, we are going to see that I don't care who you are, you can be in a lockdown that we have. We are staying at home and they can get 
so overbearing and you have so many things that have been withheld from you that you can get to a state of depression. I want to look at Elijah's life, if you have time. <clears throat> now, Elijah comes on the scene in chapter 17. He just comes on the scene. And, and in 1 Kings 17, it said, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was an inhabitant of Gilead, said unto uh, Ahab, as the Lord of God uh, of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. He comes on the scene out of nowhere, but I want you to understand that his purpose, that God brings him on the scene, is to deal with the idolatry of Israel. Israel is now worshiping idols, being influenced by Jezebel, and Ahab is allowing it, and God sends Elijah to deal with it. That's his main purpose. <clears throat> but watch this now. But now, there's a drought. God proclaims a drought by, by Elijah. Now God tells Elijah, I want you to go to a brook. And there I'm going to feed you. And, and not only feed you, but he's going to give him water. Read the story. It's fascinating how God tells him he's going to drink from the brook. But the brook dried up. Don't forget. And now, while he was there, God not only gave him water, even though the brook finally dried up, but God also was feeding him from one of the filthiest birds in the air. God was sending a, a, a morning meal to him and an eve, evening meal by a vulture, really, by an eagle is all in the same family by a buzzard. And God had said in Leviticus 11, 13, and these you shall regard as an abomination among the birds. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, the kite, and the falcon after its kind. Every raven after its kind. God tells Elijah, I'm feeding you. Watch, watch how he is, is, is uh, making steady transition. Who is God? I'm a God that can provide for you. God is a God that is providing for you. Now, Elijah now is given a second command after the brook dries up. Now, God tells him that he sends him, and from verses 8 to 16, God said, I want you to go to Zarephath. Because I sent a, a widow there to provide for him. Elijah goes there. And there's a widow. To this paraphrase the story, he tells the widow to bring me some water. And then he tells her, and bring me something to eat. But she says, what's what she says here? In Chapter 17 and verse 13 and verse 10. Watch this. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and not to make for thee and thy son. The widow said, All I have is a little bit of flour, one little bit of oil, to make one last meal for me and my son, then we're going to die. But Elijah said, Wait. You go make what you intended to, but give me first. And to make a long story sh short, she did as Elijah said, brethren, and the oil never failed, and the barrel of meal was never failed. But God would stop that. 
But what is he doing? Elijah, I will use whatever means. I will use whoever I will to provide for you. So Elijah is following God's instructions and God is training the man to believe and trust in him. But then he doesn't stop there. Then Elijah goes and you will see that the son of the woman dies. Now the woman thinks God, I mean Elijah is not, uh, God is really uh, punishing her for some sin. And here's what Elijah did. Elijah goes, takes the son, lays upon the son, and he prays to God that the soul of the young boy will come back into him. And church, do you know what happened? The son came back alive. God had the power to restore life. So Elijah is experiencing a providing God. He is experiencing a restoring God. And all that he's doing is showing you also the power of prayer. Because he prays to God to restore this young man's life. And God grants his prayer and the soul came back in to the young boy in 1 Kings 17, 21 through 24. What am I doing? I'm giving you some background that you can understand that when you are a child of God, when you are a man of God, when you have been working with God in a positive way and God has been showing you, he will provide for you, that he's a God that can restore you. And now you're going to come to a point in your life, and I wonder if you will remember what he's already done. Because Elijah is heading for a crisis. But I want you to know his background. So therefore, here he is. And do you know what church? Zarephath. This woman makes a statement that she knows now that Elijah is a man of God and she knows that there's a different God than her idols that she used to worship. Do you see that? I don't have time to really go through all that background, but I'm just setting you up for my lesson about Elijah's life later on. You need to see the background. And the background is God has been working with this man. But before we go any further, there's a statement that is made that puts everything into perspective. In James 5, meet me at verse number 17. James 5, for those of you who are following along with this lesson, James 5 and verse number 17. Elias, or Elijah, was a man subject to like passions or nature as we are. You all see that? Now the big part of the verse says, and he prayed earnestly, that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. But what I want you to notice is, he is a man with like passions, just like us. I don't care who you are. You can be a prophet. You can be a minister, a pastor, a deacon, and God has been working with your life, but James said, do not forget. You are just a man, and as long as we are men, we have a common nature and we are subject to certain circumstances and how you react is going for you is going to depend on how 
is going to meet your fears. Watch this. He's done the thing. Now, if you keep that in mind, Elijah, in chapter 18, I'm almost where I want to be. In chapter 18 now, he meets Ahab and he challenges the prophet of Baal. They go up to a mountain. Y'all know the story. They go up to Mount Carmel. 450. He said, bring all of those. And he said, we are going to prepare a sacrifice. If God be God, worship him. But if Baal be Baal, worship him. But he said, how hard you between two opinions. Make up your mind who Jehovah is and who you're going to serve. And to make a long story short, they went up there. Baal prophets cut themselves and jumped and prayed and all day. And Elijah got very sarcastic and said, maybe he's on vacation. Because he could not take up the sacrifice. Then Elijah prepares his animal, built his altar. Put water around the altar. Pray to God. And fire came down and this burnt up the sacrifice. And lapped up even the water. I mean, it was an awesome demonstration that there's one God and he has the power to control the events in this world then and now. There is one God. And after that now, Elijah had a mountaintop experience. But our text says Jezebel sends a message he's going to kill him. Now what does he do? This his response was, he runs for his life. I wonder why. You would have thought that after God had been working with him and showing him who he is, you would have thought that he would have ran from Jezebel. She's just another woman. I mean, what has God done? God has separated uh, him as a servant, and God has used him in a powerful way. But what he does is that he runs for his life. In other words, faith meets fear, and fear took over, and he ran. What do we do in the midst of a threat? In the midst of a crisis, faith meets fear. How do we deal with it? But watch what he does. He runs, he separates himself from the servant. Whenever you are heading for the valley of depression, the first thing you want to do. Sometimes you want to be alone. Then we see he wants to die. So now, is this the man that God provided water for and food by the river? Is this the man that God provided food by the widow of Zarephath? Is this the man that God destroyed life through his prayer? Is this the same man? The answer is yes. But he's running for his life. What has happened to Elijah? He's showing signs of depression. What really brings on to a man's life that he's depressed? But don't forget, he's just a man. You may see some Christians in your congregation a talking, a talk you never thought you would hear. You may hear some Christians in your congregation talking, talking and showing that they have little faith in God because there's something happening and they're heading toward the valley to where they want to give up. Don't ever give up. 
Because the first step for depression is discouragement. You have been trying to do certain things and it's not working out and now you are discouraged. Well, let's see what we can learn from the text. God comes to him and God says, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? What are you doing here? I believe that God is telling this man, after all I have done for you, what are you doing here running from a woman? Have I not shown you on Mount Carmel that I am God? I am all powerful. God has to teach him one more lesson. That he's the God that will protect. Watch this. When you look at where he is now, by himself, because he left his servant, he's by himself. He don't want to talk to nobody. He just by himself and he said, kill me. I'm no more worthy than my father's word. I will to die. And don't take that statement lightly because I was just reading. Last night, an EMT worker put a gun to his head and killed himself because he was working very hard in the midst of this pandemic. Then we have that, that violence in the home has increased. This pandemic can drive you to the valley of depression and you must be careful. Now watch this. So God is going to help him because the man, I guarantee you, is in a valley. It starts with being discouraged and fear. What is discouragement? Studies have said it is a temporary feeling of disappointment resulting from a disadvantages, turn, turn of events, either physical, material, social, emotional, or spiritual. It does not avoid anybody. Anybody can come to the area in your life to where as you are discouraged. And if you don't deal with it, it will turn into depression. We have come to the master's office this morning because we are depressed. We have come to talk with God that he can tell us to be careful that you're not the first one who have been depressed. You are not the first one who have forgotten what I've done for you. You are not the first one who have forgotten I've put food on your table, clothing on your back, a roof over your head. You are not the first one who forget. And now you have a crisis, you are discouraged, and you are depressed in your house, and you are even thinking of taking your life. Don't you get to that point, church? Just remember what he has done. And I believe you can avoid depression. What is depression? It is a mental state of excessive sadness. It is a protracted period of despondency that greatly curtails or even destroys one's ability to function as a healthy and happy child of God. We must try our best not to be negative, have negative thoughts at home, in our hearts, but we have to learn how to let it go. Let it go. If you harbor certain thoughts, fears in your heart, it will weigh you down to where you can get into a state of depression. I have learned as a minister, I have told people that if they have things in their life or if they have a complaint, even the church, talk to me, talk about it. 
And after we deal with it, let it go. If you keep all of that stuff in your heart, it would wear you down. Some people will keep all of that trouble and thoughts and fears in their heart and even lead them to have a heart attack. For the, for the weight and stress that what they're dealing with. I have learned psychologically to let it go. Especially once I've dealt with it. Yeah, so here is Elijah. Evidently, he has come to a point in his life that fear has taken him over. Now, I'm very, uh, uh, y'all forgive me, but when I read that he was running, I just couldn't believe it at first. I said, he probably thought that when Jezebel had heard he had killed 450, and what happened to Mount Carmel, that Jezebel was saying, I'm not going to bother with Elijah, because his God is better than my God, and, 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 and now she's going to leave him alone. But no. This woman says, I'm coming after you, and I'm going to kill you. And he starts running. And I believe fear was driving him to run. So here it is. How do you deal with that day? How do you deal with it, man? Well, let's look at the person. And I want to use scripture. Because rather than we need scripture, I don't care what anybody says. The word of God, you must use it. It will help you to deal with any situation. Now I believe that it's in this book, sixty-six book, it's in there. If you can apply it to your situation, in Psalm one nineteen, watch this now, verse number eleven. Psalm one nineteen and verse number eleven. David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Hiding the word in your heart will give you what you need at certain points in your life. Not only for sin, but when you hide the word in your heart, it is a buffer to fight against anything that might come to destroy your sanctity, your joy in the Lord. So David said, I put that word in my heart. He says here in Colossians 3.16, watch this. Paul said, I'm, I'm trying to show you the word. Paul says, let the words of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Teaching and admonishing one another in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Saying and embracing your heart to the Lord. Paul said, let the word of Christ dwell. So in other words, if you don't have the word then what do you have? Because faith comes by the word. And if you don't have faith, and when fear knocks in at the door of your life, you will do what Elijah is doing. You will run, you will get in seclusion, you will say it all over, you will be discouraged, and you may want to die. But the word if it's in your heart, it will be a buffer and it will build your faith. Psalm 55, verse 22. I'm just showing you you need the word. Psalm 55 and the verse 22. <clears throat> he says, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall what? Sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. 
But he says, cast thy burdens upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. We need to be praying people. We need to be people who have the word and believe the word. And no matter what anybody says, you keep that word and you keep praying. That's what we need the Christian to be doing today. We need to be praying. When God asks Elijah, what are you doing here? The man should have been praying. He prayed for everything else. Why are you not praying for God to give you strength to combat Jezebel? He had the 450. He can handle Jezebel. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? We discussed the morning, this morning in our Bible class. We need to pray for our leaders, our government. Is that not right? We have read scripture that says that those who are in leadership position, God have allowed it to happen. See, we try to look at the situation and we in our little mind can't see God the holy God allowing the negativity how is God allowing all these people to die how is God allowing our government that we are some more, most of us are not pleased with how is he allowing it leave it to God because if he can bring a raven a filthy bird to feed a holy man he can use a filthy Government to bring something about it to bless us. Why don't you keep praying and wait? Children of God, children of God need to be praying, children of God. They don't need to complain. You pray, pray, pray. That's our weapon. Worship Him. Show God that you love Him. You got faith in him because you have been with us all the prior time. What think, what make you think he's gonna give up on you now? Come on, church. We can do better, but let's pray. And I don't just mean praying on Sunday morning. I mean praying through the day. Can you imagine the millions of Christians are praying all over the world? You know what that says to God? They still believe in me. They still know I can provide. They still know that I can protect. They still know that I have all the power. That's why they're praying to me. So I want you to think about how you can deal with this crisis and not let depression get you into a mental state that you just start complaining, complaining, and you want to give up, and you just want to die. Now, no, no, the child of God should never get to that point. Now, watch this now. We have some example in the Word of God to those who have dealt with it, who have dealt with the crisis. Do you remember, old Job? All of us Remember, Job, anybody the school. The Bible tells us the story of Job. How Job was suffering, sores all over his body, but one thing Job did not know, that God and Satan was having a contest. This crisis in our government there's one thing that we do not know. What is God doing to allow it? See, you are not God. All God wants you to do is what Job said, naked came I into the world and naked came I, when I go back into my mother's womb. Or do have to say what Job said, the Lord give it and the Lord take it away. That's a man of faith. And if you see what Job went through, 
Then the Bible says in Job 42, verse number 10, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed, underline pray. And who did he pray for? He prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Who were his friends? The friends were the miserable comforters who would tell him he had sinned. The Bible tells us to pray for our enemies. Amen. Amen. Prayer. Prayer. That's what we need, church. I got a call just last night, this brother, that we want to have the, our whole nation of the church all over our nation to be praying at a certain time. And I think it's a good idea because instead of complaining, we need to be praying. And when you pray, God heals. And over there, when, <laughs> when you see God hears, he'll come down. No, I can do something, but I mean, you got to keep praying. Then we have the Apostle Paul. I'm almost there. And then we have the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was a man who went through a lot of crises in his life. In 2 Corinthians 11, in the verses 22, you can read it when you get time. But well, maybe I'll just wait for you to turn to it. And you tell me about this Apostle Paul inspired by God with the Holy Spirit. And God is allowing this man to go through all of this. The average man will run if he forgets who he is and who he belongs to. Watch this. 2 Corinthians 11, 22. He discusses many struggles of his life. Watch this. Paul broke from his broke from his early religion. Didn't he? Do you know right now this morning? By the time I end, I'm going to tell you how to be saved. And it might mean that you have to break from your what you have been taught all your life. And if you believe in God's message and it tells you how to be saved and you have been taught contrary to what the word says, you have to break from that religious folly. Are you willing to do that? What Paul? He left following Judaism, beaten above measure, stoned, imprisoned. Shipwreck. In addition, he said, the care of all the churches. Then he had a thorn in his flesh, and God answered him by saying, My grace is sufficient. Would you leave God or would you hang in there? And then he says here, then he says here, he says that when you let God work with you through all your troubles, God told the man that my power, he said, is seen in Paul's weakness. Paul didn't mind going through all of that suffering because God's power could be seen in his life because he said, when I am weak, I am strong. See, you, God wants his glory and he's going to get his glory. And if you're here this morning and you are feeling sad, I'm trying to tell you, talk to somebody. Don't just stay by yourself. Don't come to a conclusion that it's all over for me to just give up and do something ungodly. Don't you do that. You, you need to talk to somebody. Call a brother. Call a sister. Talk to somebody. Now I believe Paul was in prison. Y'all remember that? He was on lockdown. Like we are to stay at home lockdown. But what did he do? In Acts 16, 
25, I'm going to read it to you. The Bible says, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were what? Praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. God heard them and they came out of that prison. We are in lockdown. What should we do when we're in lockdown? You pray and worship God wherever you are. You don't start complaining. You don't get all depressed. But we are human. And we are all can be subject to depression. But we need to know is to let that word be one of your counselors and let your prayer go up to God and let him know what you need. There's no need to complain. But let us not live in a life of depression. I believe in 1 Timothy 6, in verse number 17, Paul writes to the young man, and he says, For well, we brought nothing into this world. And it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Do you know? You might not can go and improve your wardrobe that you would like. You can't even go to the beauty park. You can't even have your hair cut and show it up, Lord, I need one right now this morning. But that doesn't get me upset. But what I pray God for, I have clothing on my, my, my family and myself. I got food on my table. I'm content. I'm content. I haven't missed a meal. My family haven't missed a meal. What am I complaining for? I'm not making as much money as I used to. Because when I work, I work overtime. I all that I understand. But, but God has said, you're going to get an employment check. Be happy with that. That's enough to put food on your table. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. No need to get in that head and demonstrate with a gun in your hand. No need in doing that foolishness. You pray, pray, pray. And you wait on God. Now, I said in the Bible class, when I look at the unemployment check, I see God name on that one. Oh, that $1,200, I didn't get the letter, sir. Uh, 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 I see God name on that check. You know, I don't see Trump name. You know, I see God. And I know everybody's saying they didn't get, you know, their check, and, and some people don't get it. I understand that. But the you hear? Be ye thankful. And if you're here this morning, what I want to also leave with you is this. If you find that you are not improving out of your sadness and despondency, seek professional help. Not what some people will, will tell you. Man, all you need is to pray the word of God. Listen to me. God has not allowed our medical field, all of these doctors for no reason. See, God may have worked miraculously at a time in the Bible. But now you cannot think that what God is going to do is miraculously answer your prayer to everything you want in your life. Go get you some help. There's nothing wrong with going to therapy church. Do you hear what I'm saying? You have some professional people in the church. I, 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 I'm not going to call this brother name, but this brother here has a degree and he specializes in mental illness. Check him out. Talk to him. Every preacher don't have 
uh, 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 the capability. When it comes down to mental illnesses and how you can, 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 can give someone therapy to get out of that. Amen. Amen. So what we have seen here today is that no, no matter who you are, you can get into depression. You can be discouraged. Now, you may say, but well, Brother Hayward, what happened to Elijah? Well, you know what happened to Elijah? You, you, I don't have time to preach all that. But what happened to Elijah is this. God counseled him. Read the rest of his story. If you, God let him know, I know what you're going through. And you ain't the only one left. You're not the only faithful person. No. God said, I have more people that have not kissed the feet of an idol. That have not kissed the idol. I have more people. And he counseled Elijah, told him how to anoint certain men that would take care of the evil. And I'm standing by to tell you right now this morning, God is setting up men and women to take care of this situation and we need to keep praying and providentially I do believe this too shall come to pass. So what are you doing this morning? How do you feel? Are you sitting there saying you don't want to even hear from anybody? You're saying, is God punishing me? No one understands what I'm going through. Huh? Church, listen. Talk to somebody. We who that live, know people who live alone, I have instructed people to always touch bases with those people. Because they live by themselves. They need to talk to somebody. And, and let me tell you something about it. And if you talk to somebody who lives alone, don't rush them off the phone. You have to feel that they need to talk to somebody. You can encourage them and lift them up. And if you're here and listening to this program, I hope and pray that you see that James 5, 17 said, it reminds us the A part of the verse, he was a man after like nature and like passion. And as long as we are human beings, we have to say to ourselves, I don't care how long you've been in the church, I don't care how long you've been preaching, I don't care, care, care what, what if you are an elder or a deacon, as long as you remember you are just a man. You're not God. So we have to beware when we hear of a brother or sister who has fallen to uh, a little sadness and, and, and discouragement, and you please don't call them and say, I don't see how you can say that. You've been in the church for 30 years. Don't please don't say that. Don't say that, see, because you'd be a miserable comfort. You need to talk positively to lift people up. Now, if you're here, there's a more important thing that I want to just talk with you for a short while before I go. And that is this. There's never been a time that is more urgent. Well, not never been a time, but this is an urgent time for you to make sure that you have a right relationship with God. Let me share something with you. All of the conversions in the Bible ends in baptism after the cross of Jesus. When we look at a man named Cornelius, Cornelius was a praying man. Cornelius was a giving man. But God told him Send for Peter. He's going to tell you some words that you need to hear. You can be given to the church 
give it to some good program for people who are in need. You can be praying to God, but that does not save you. You need to hear words whereby you must be saved. We have the unit. Came from religious service. And as I said before, you may have to change your religious service. Change your religious belief if you want to be saved. And the unit, even though he was well off and came from worshiping God, but he needs to hear word whereby he must be saved. And each one of those cases, they preach unto him Jesus. And let me tell you something. Sinner's prayer will not save you. It didn't save Cornelius. No. Getting a miraculous endowment of the Holy Spirit on that day with Cornelius didn't save him. No. It was only let the Jews know that God had decided that the Gentiles should be member of the same body. They're going to be members of the church and no longer are you to look at them as being unclean. Because whoever God had made clean, don't you dare say he's unclean. That's why he gave up the Holy Spirit. God doesn't do that today. I don't care what anybody tells you. You will not be saved by waiting on some baptism from God. You need to hear the word of God. And Cornelius was baptized. Paul, before Saul, was baptized. The eunuch was baptized by Peter to wash away their sins and to be saved. You need to get a right relationship. I'm always a little sad sometimes when I hear about people dying and dying out of the Lord. That hurts me, man. And this is why every gospel preacher, when he closes whatever he preaches, he tells folk how to be saved. The gospel preacher job is to sure enough instruct people that after all that good expository preaching, gospel preaching, how can I make you right with God? How can I be right with God? I need to hear the gospel, believe the gospel that Jesus, God's son, came to this earth in flesh, died for my sins. I need to believe that. And I need to repent and tell God I am surrendering Surrendering my life to you. Take my life and mold me and make me after your will. Repentance me. I was living one way, but now that I'm giving myself to you, I'm going to live in a different way. And confess his sweet name. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now I'm going to sit in prayer. You ain't got to feel nothing. You have to obey something. And then being baptized. Baptism puts you in Christ. God is in 3, 26, 27. Jesus said, He that believeth in baptized shall be saved. And I told Paul, why tell me thou arrive and be baptized? Why? Washing away your sin, call it on the name of the Lord. Yes. Acts 2 38. The church got started. How did it get started? Through baptism, about 3,000 souls. What makes you think you can pray your way in? You cannot do it. So as I close, we're in a crisis. I do believe that. But it's a bigger crisis that has been in this world since the God of Eden. And it's called sin. And you get to a relationship right with God. And if you are called home in this pandemic for me to live as Christ, for me to die as gain, Child of God shouldn't worry about that. Well, you worry about dying in love and dying in faith, and everything will be all right. That's my lesson for you. 
a mountaintop experience, man. But to the valley of depression. That's what happened to Elijah. But he recovered. Be the best of the story. I have to preach on that. But he recovered. Oh, he recovered. He recovered. And God took him on up into heaven. Amen, amen. If you're here and you want to give your life to Christ, call the number that's going to be on the screen. I promise you, we will baptize you. Our water is always ready. Our gowns are always ready. If you want to be baptized, we will baptize you. And you can make your relationship right with God. God bless you for listening to me. I hope and pray that you keep remembering that the greatest comfort we have is this word. It is medicine for my soul. It is medicine for my soul. That's the comfort I have. And we hope and pray that you'll keep following our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you don't mind, before we close, I would like but the Lord to come forth and close with the word of prayer. I want him to pray that we can stay faithful. I want him to thank God for what he's doing for us. And I hope and pray, brothers and sisters, that you won't give up. Don't give up. Please don't get so depressed that you think it's all over. God loves you. I want him to pray for the, the, those of the front line. Pray for all of those people, man. And pray for the people who still need support in a financial way that have not been, that, that, that have not received any help yet. Now, this, this government ain't perfect, but we need to pray to God that he will open up the resources that everyone can get something to keep them going down life's way. God bless you. See you all next Sunday. Better Let us go to the Father in prayer. All his power, all us. Father God, who is up high and lifted up low, we thank you for all the blessings seen and unseen in our lives, Heavenly Father. We ask for forgiveness of sins and word, word, and deed, things that separate us from you. But Father God, at this time we are praying for those who are helping others who are putting their lives at stake. Amen. It's, it's amazing, Heavenly Father, what, what people go through at this time, Heavenly Father. Many are losing jobs and we're just praying for those who are sick and people are dying. And Father God, we just need your strength, Heavenly Father. We as Christians, we need to hold on right now, Heavenly Father, to your unchanging Father God, if we have fallen short in any way, continue to bless us, Heavenly Father. Amen. Build us up, Heavenly Father, in those areas where we are weak. Help us remain and build our faith, Heavenly Father. We ask all those things in Jesus' name.